Sorry, I just needed a little bit more of some singing. Singing just uh, fills you up, amen? Please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Uh, my name is Jonathan Davis. For those uh, who are visiting, I have the honor and the privilege to lead this amazing region of the New York City Church. It's incredible. You know, I bring you, uh, I bring you greetings from Connecticut. A lot of us were uh, in Connecticut this weekend to do uh, the wedding of Clifford and Sarah, now Jacob, amen, which is incredible. And of course, I had the honor to officiate it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, just overall a great weekend. Of course, Sarah is like a uh, daughter to Kiana and I. She was on the original mission team to Connecticut with us, uh, so she holds a very dear place in our heart. And Clifford's awesome, too. We like him. He called me today. He called me when he wanted to ask uh, her to be his girlfriend. I was like, sure, okay, bro. <laughs> I was just kidding. But uh, we had a great conversation. Um, you know, uh, I, I thought that uh, Emeka's communion was just incredible. Uh, bro, I appreciate you sharing your heart so vulnerably. Uh, definitely, bro. I, I think it's very fitting uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is going to be awesome. And of course, thank you both for sharing for a uh, contribution with your lovely wife, Amanda. Uh, look, Romans chapter 12. You know, I originally wanted to preach this sermon last week, but then I decided to preach that ICCM sermon which I realized should probably stay in ICCM, but amen. But it was an interesting sermon. I didn't write that sermon, um, but I did change it a little bit. <laughs> uh, Romans chapter 12, I did write this one, uh, just not the Bible. Verse 1, the Bible reads, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. A living sacrifice. The Bible calls us to offer our bodies, ourselves, as a living sacrifice that's pleasing to God. The title of the sermon is simply Surrender. Surrender. You know, uh, oftentimes I believe we can get uh, two things mixed up, commitment and surrender. In fact, they are two different things. Commitment is like, okay, hey, yeah, I'm going to commit to reading my Bible every day. I'm going to commit to praying. I'm going to commit to going to church. I'm going to commit to giving contribution, to giving missions. I'm going to commit which that is very important. We understand that God strengthens those who are fully committed to him, amen? amen? Now, one of the things here to understand about surrender is that surrender is you are relinquishing control. That you are hands up, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. There's no arguing, there's no debate, there's no making a decision, you're just surrendered. Just letting it happen. Point number one, it's simply just going to be control. Look at Matthew chapter 26. We're only going to have two points. I'm trying to limit myself to two points because every time I say three points and it'll be a short lesson, it is not. So I figured if I cap myself with two points, we have a shot. Matthew chapter 26. Now, if you're familiar with this, you understand what's happening here. That uh, Jesus is uh, just recently in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. He's overwhelmed. And the Luke account, it says he was sweating blood. He was so overwhelmed. He uh, went with his disciples, his closest friends on earth. And he says, hey, sit here while we, while, and pray so that you may not be tempted. And they fell asleep three times. Jesus, of course, was bearing his heart to God. He asks God, he says, hey, Father, if this cup, can you please take this cup from me? Not my will, but yours. And so it's very powerful that you see that Jesus, even here, asks God for another way. You see, he knows what's about to happen. He knows that he's about to be mocked, beaten, 
and tortured, and he's innocent. He's done nothing wrong but try to help save the world. And yet, Jesus is surrendered, and he's ready to do the will of God. Let's pick it up in verse 47. Verse 47, it says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12 arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, and struck the sword of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in this place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? We'll stop right there. Now, this is a very, very powerful verse. I think oftentimes we might glance over this a little bit. Of course, a legion, you understand, is a thousand. So Jesus here is saying, I I, I could get 12,000 angels here. Or 10 or 12? Six. Six. What did I say? 12? Thanks, bro. You're a beast. But at the end of the day, if you read and you understand angels in the Bible, one angel in the Old Testament slaughtered 185,000 people. One angel. And he says, hey, I, I, my father will send 12 legions. So I want you to understand the power that Jesus just dropped right here. But yet, he says, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Jesus had the power to change his circumstance, and he surrendered and said, your will, Father, I will do it. He had the power to change what his future was going to be. But he relinquished control to God and submitted to his father. You know, it's uh, very, when you process that and you understand it, it's like, whoa. I would have summoned those 12 legions. But Jesus loved all of us so much to surrender. He cared for each and every one of us. And he surrendered to torture, being beaten, and hung on a cross and killed for all of us. Not only that, all of his closest friends abandoned him, disowned him. You ever felt lonely? Imagine Jesus. Imagine being put to death and people laughing at you and rolling dice for your clothes in front of you as you hang there dying. That's what Jesus was looking forward to. And his heart was surrender. In uh, Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. You know, it's trusting in God with all your heart is surrender. That no matter what is going on, you're like, you know what, God, you're in control. I'm here. And you're ready to let God work. You see, if you're in control, God is not. If you're in control trying to fix your future, God is not there with you. To let, allow God to fix your future, you got to relinquish control and let God work. Look at Psalms chapter 106. I've been uh, reading through the book of Psalms uh, for my Bible plan, which is incredible. And so I read Psalm 106 uh, and Psalm 109, which we'll read next uh, this morning. And I thought this was just a super powerful verse. And I want to share it with you. Psalm chapter 106. Let's, let's look in verse, uh, verse 10. 
of Psalm chapter 106, verse 10, it says, He saved them from the hand of the foe. From the hand of the enemy, he redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. This, of course, is, is giving you a little history lesson about, uh, history lesson about God uh, and Moses taking, uh, God taking them out of Egypt from captivity and crossing the desert. Now, uh, of course, if you read the story, it's super funny. Uh, it's, it's interesting, baffling. Uh, funny by baff, I mean baffling. That literally every crazy, like imagine watching the, the, the Red Sea waters just part. And imagine having a fire of pillar that guides you by night and a cloud that guides you by day. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's what they're facing. That's what they're around. Imagine seeing Moses make water come from a rock. Imagine you see just quail just everywhere randomly and just bread, manna just flowing from heaven. Like these were the miracles they saw. Yeah. And then they just always were just stiff-necked and stubborn and went back and like, oh, we want meat. We, at least we had meat in Egypt in slavery. Oh, why'd you bring us out here to die in the desert? And they just forgot the torture and the bondage that they were in. You see, oftentimes we can forget what God has saved us from. That we were once in captivity by our sin in darkness and didn't even know it. And we forget the feeling of how we felt when all those sins were washed away. I remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a crier. Everyone knows that. <laughs> I, uh, I did the wedding and I forgot half of the stuff I was going to say. And I started crying. I was like, what in the world is going on here? <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm officiating this thing. I got to be solid, you know? Like, Sarah needs to cry, you know? <laughs> but when we, we can forget that brokenness, that we want surrender to Jesus, and we become stubborn and stiff-necked, and we start longing for the world again. We start getting those cravings from the world. We want all these worldly promises. We want the money. We want, we want riches and fame. We, we want uh, immorality. We want impurity. And, and our, our cravings just get so strong, we forget that we've been saved from that stuff. And then we put God to the test. Look at Psalms 109. Control. Psalms chapter 109, look in verse in verse 1. Now we we in life we, we go through hardships, and typically it's the hardships and the troubles that lead us to go back to those things that make us comfortable, right? Because when we start struggling, we're like, oh God, where, where's the promises? Where where's the the, the, the the fruit, the amazing life that you promised me? Where's the, uh, the, the uh, Jeremiah 29, 11? Where, where is it at? And, and, and we're just like, God, where have you been? And then we, we forget, and that this is what the Israelites said. They, they did not wait on God's plan to unfold. You see, we want things now. We want, we want our future now. God, we want the blessings now. I want the wife, the husband now. I want the kids, I want the fame, I want the rich, I want all the good promises now. God's like, no, you need hardship because I want you to be the person that you need to be in the future, the man and the woman that I want you to be. And instead of waiting for that, we take control. I'm going to fix my future. I'm going to go after this because I want to. And we relinquish God's control and put back on ours. We throw off all of our armor and just go back into the world. Hardship can be the cause for most of us. Psalm chapter 109, this actually really uh, encouraged me. Uh, I thought, I, I don't know what's been going on, but 
Noah shared this, and Mecca and Amanda shared this, and I, I was feeling this. I had a tough week. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what in the world's going on here, you know? I had a tough couple of weeks, actually. And my heart has been heavy. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm, we're just getting blasted, I think. I think, I think, I think the devil, the, this evil forces or whatever, I think they're coming. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a future here in New York, and I think we're getting smacked around. And I'm just like, man, I'm waking up and I'm just like, what is going on? Right. I, I'm hearing people are talking to me and texting me like, why, why are all these problems happening? Right. <laughs> and I, had, I reflected, I was like, man, this is hard. This is tough. This is challenging. I'm feeling overwhelmed. You know, and I, and it's like as I get closer to June, the more stress comes. Right. Every day I just get more and more stress. I haven't felt depressed in a long time. In the last three weeks, my depression spiked like never before. Oh. And I'm just, I was sitting there and I was like, I thought I was done with this. You know, it's, uh, it sucks to wake up and feel like the world is ending. It sucks that that feeling is just terrible. It, it, it's hard to... To feel happy but not feel happy. It's tough. You know, um, hardship. I was trying to figure out, you know, what do I need to to get through uh, the next few weeks? Because as we get closer to June, it's, you know, obviously Luke and Brandon are leaving, transition's Mm -hmm. happening, and we got to move again, which moving is stressful, and then I have a baby due. Another one. Oh, that's happy. I'm happy about the baby. <laughs> but man, three little kids sounds stressful. And then it's, you know, coming out here, I came out here obviously because Luke and Brandon asked me. And I'm like, man, I just feel like, who's going to help me with my kids? <laughs> you know? It is just, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to feel. But it's weird because I'm excited. But the heart hurts. So I was thinking, I was like, man, why are we going through hardship and how do we get through it? And I read this psalm this morning and it it encouraged me. Hopefully it makes sense. We'll see. Verse 1. My God whom I praise, do not remain silent. For people who are wicked are, are deceitful. Have opened, people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. You know, I read this and I was like, and it may not sound encouraging, but let me explain. I read this and I was like, wow, there's, there's a lot going here, on here from David. He's feeling a lot. His friends are turning on him. He's being accused. The wicked people are being deceitful. They're they're, they're, they're opening their mouths against him, slandering him. And they attack him without cause. But I'm a man of prayer. I believe that David, he's referenced so much throughout the Bible. And even after, obviously David did sin, but he, he repented, which was awesome. And he did have to face some consequences for his sin a couple of times. But one of the things is about David, when you read the Psalms, you see his heart. And you're like, wow, he literally bore his heart to God. These are songs. He sang to him. Praised him. A man of prayer. How did Jesus get through his hardship? Prayer. So how do we get through the the depression, the hardship, the troubles, the trials? Prayer. Because we know that we can't do it without God. The only way that we can get through it is if we relinquish control and we allow God to take that place and be our Lord. And, and, and it'll get us through that challenging situation. You know, I appreciate what Emeka shared about his, his dad. 
And I thought that was very powerful. And it's very real. And I know that hurts. You know, it's, it's really cool because my dad and I, I, obviously I grew up really without much of my father after a certain amount of years. And the only reason why I really stayed connected to him when I was a young, young child was because my grandma really wanted to see me. And so she would drive to go pick us up. And then, you know, when we lived in um, California, and she would drive from Riverside to Fresno to, to pick us up. And then uh, my mom, of course, you know, then she, my mom would drive halfway, which was, you know, amen. But it was my grandma. My grandma was the reason why I saw my dad. I've never, my dad never picked me up, ever. And I remember once we stopped talking when I was around 16, uh, when I found out some, some truths that really hurt me and I confronted him on it, you know, and we just didn't talk. And it, not, n never again. We talked one more time when I was 20, and I just yelled at him for something he did. We just argued back and forth. That was the last time I talked to him. And then I came back to God. I, gave, I relinquished control again. But I had to deal with that. I had to deal with that unforgiveness and that bitterness. Because he hurt me. And then he, uh, he reached out to me on Instagram um, back in, uh, during COVID. And uh, it was 2019. No, COVID hit in 2020. It's 2020. Um, and it was, around, it was around the summertime, I believe. It was, pretty, it was early on COVID. And he messaged me. And, but by that time, my heart was open. I've forgiven him. My heart was soft. And he said, hey, I've been hesitant to reach out to you. Wasn't sure what you would say. I know you may not want to talk to me, but I would really hope we could talk. And I replied and said, I would love to. He's never met any of my kids. Didn't even know I had three, uh, two more or one more at the time and Keanu was pregnant. Didn't even know. So we, we scheduled a time. We FaceTimed each other. Uh, we talked and he saw, I, I had him meet uh, Jonah for the first time and you know, he started crying. And I've never seen that man cry. And uh, he met uh, Kiana, started crying again, was proud of the, do the woman that I married. <laughs> He's like, that's my daughter. And then he apologized. And I, I, I remember that moment because I never thought I'd see the day. I was content and surrendered that we would just never talk again, that he would just, we would just never communicate. And we did. Even more so was my older brother and him. My older brother, he has a lot more scars than I do. And I, because of my dad and I fixing our relationship, I was able to bridge the gap between both of them. And the other day, about two weeks ago, they talked for the first time in probably 20 years. And it was, it was incredible. It was a, a powerful, powerful moment. But what happens is, is when we relinquish control and we allow God to take over, we see miracles happen. Yeah. We see great things in our lives, things that we never would ever think, and God makes it happen. But I am a man of prayer. I want to challenge each and every one of you that no matter what you're going through is to be a man or a woman of prayer. How do you get through the day? Prayer. How do you get through the night? Prayer. The month? Prayer. The year? Prayer. Come on, Marvin. But why do we pray? But we know we pray because God intervenes for us, that God gets us through our hardships. Now, he may allow you to stay in that hardship, but God will strengthen you so that way your foot will not slip and you'll make it. But if we're the ones in control and we don't pray, we don't go to God, we don't trust and surrender, hands up, God, you're in control, then we know. 
that we're going to be stuck and it's going to be even worse. But God will change our circumstances. Even if he does it, he'll make you stronger and you'll get through it. Look in 2 Kings chapter 1, chapter 5, excuse me. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Control. It's like that, uh, what's that song? Jesus, take the wheel. That's it, you know? It's an old classic. I don't know those are. I know, I know, I know a little bit. It's been a while. Yeah, it's kind of like driving because I like to be the one driving. It's just my control. Like, I, I'm a control guy, right? This lesson was really for me. And I figured, hey, there's a few people I've talked to that are feeling the similar things that I'm feeling. I was like, hey, man, let's preach about it. So I made this lesson for myself. All right. Thank you. But it's cool because I figured this out when uh, the Kirshners, when the Williamsons were here. We had a great conversation with them. And, and this is what we talked about. Surrender. He said, bro, you got to surrender. You surrender to God. But then he, it got me to the second point that he talked about. He said, bro, you're, see, you're just getting through. You know this stuff is happening. You're just getting through. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel it. It's okay to be sad. That's okay. You know, Michael's like a, you know, a man's man. You know what I mean? He said, bro, you got to cry. You need to cry. It's healing. And he said, you got you to gotta stop trying to just get through it. You're just trying to just muscle through. You got to accept it. Point number two is acceptance. 2 Kings chapter 5. Don't worry, there's only two scriptures in this point. Verse 1. It says, there's a little story here. I love this story. Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier but had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served uh, Naaman's wife. She, had, she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go. The king of Rome replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. That's a pretty interesting letter to the king, huh? It's interesting. Look at this response. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick up a quarrel with me? When Elisha and, the, Elisha and the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the men come to me, and he will know that there was a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horse and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to, to say to him, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. And said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Fafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant, servants went to him and said, my father... If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. We'll stop right there. You know, acceptance. You know, oftentimes what happens in our lives is we are given something to do or some task that just sounds ludicrous. We're like, why in the world would I do that? 
And Naaman was sitting here. He's like, look, this water, it, 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 the waters in Damascus are way better than all the waters in Israel. Why do I got to jump into that dirty water? It's kind of like the, the little ponds in, uh, Times Square, in uh, Central Park. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Hey, go dip yourself seven times in Central Park. You might come out with... That was Naaman's thought. He's like, wait a second. I might come... What? What? <laughs> Have you seen that Central Park water, Elisha? What's wrong with you? I actually have baptized people in that water. Let me tell you, your skin's itching when you come out of that water. It's, it's pretty tough. Praise God for a building. You know, but we have to accept the path that God has put us on. God has chosen a path for each and every one of us. We only get off it when we choose to take control and not accept the path, the lot that he has given us. What would have happened if uh, Naaman would have just went home? He'd still have leprosy. And this story would probably not be in the Bible. It wouldn't matter anymore. But he accepted it after a nice little gentle discipling from one of his servants. Amen. Discipling really helps us out. You see, at first he chose not to accept this healing. Kaimi said, discipling really helps us out. I see you laughing. No, I'm just playing. I'm, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but discipling, when we accept it, we find healing. You know, it's interesting that oftentimes I know those of us who disciple people and Sometimes you disciple people that, amen, it's a, it's a joy and a blessing, and there's no, never an issue. And there's some times when you disciple somebody, and amen, you don't know what's going to happen. I've been on both sides as a disciplee with my discipler. <laughs> I'm sure Luke has showed up like, amen, what's going to happen today? <laughs> amen. But that's okay. It doesn't matter which side you fall on. What matters is that you're going to grow and change and make it to heaven. That's what matters. You know, but we, we as, as disciples, we got to understand something. We don't, as disciples, we don't disciple you because we have a waste of breath and we just don't have nothing to say. We're just like, hey, whatever, let me just say this and so hopefully it lands, you know. No, we care for you and we want you to change. We as leaders, as a disciple, we are responsible for you. And you got to understand that. That literally the Bible says your blood is on our hands. So if we don't call you out, we are responsible before God. That, well, that's what it means to lead. And that's tough. Could you imagine standing before Jesus and said, you did not speak up to that sister and that brother. Did you even love them? That's scary. So I have a very strong conviction that I will call out every single thing. And that's it. That's me. I see it. See something. Say something. New York City subway. That's what I'm doing. I, you know, I'm, I'm not being rejected for nobody. <laughs> that's not happening. But what that means is you got to have some uncomfortable conversations. That means you got to put yourself in a space where they're like, oh, my goodness, what, what, what's going to happen? It, you may have to talk about mental health. You may have to talk about money, relationships, everything that's a little bit touchy. you got to talk about it. Why? Because it's for the betterment of somebody else. And for those of us, I, I appreciate my disciples. I love Luke. And I know, I know, I've, give, I've given Luke probably the hardest time out of everyone he's ever discipled. I think he's actually told me that before. But the thing is, is without Luke, I would be probably in jail or dead. That's the reality. That's how much he's believed in me. That's how much he's loved me. And let me tell you, Luke does not let me off the hook with anything. Nothing. Even about some of you. No. Nothing. Like, there's nothing. No. Hey, bro, why did this brother say this? Did you talk to him about that? Like, Luke is making sure that I'm even helping you. 
That, that, that's discipling. Why? Because Luke doesn't just care about me. He cares about you. Yeah. And that's the heart. But sometimes we get asked to do something that just sounds a little nasty. Oh. <laughs> like, I got to dip myself in this water. But sometimes we got to do that to find that healing. Yeah. We need that. If we would just simply accept the lot that God has given us, we save ourselves from a lot of pain. Now, you may have to accept pain and hardship and trouble. That's okay. You know what happens when you resist it? You prolong the hardship and the pain and the trouble. And you keep going through it, and you keep going through it until you get the message. You ever go to D-Time and you get discipled on the same thing week over week over week over week over week? Yes. And you're like, bro, are you ever going to get this? Are you just going to repent? Like, come on. What are we doing? I've been there too. <laughs> I've been that guy. It's terrible. <laughs> Uni's pretty humble. I like, I like, I like Uni. Uni changes. He's got conviction. But we prolong it by not accepting it, and then it just magnifies, and it becomes crippling. Look in Romans chapter 12. Let's get back to Romans. Acceptance is key. You know, when I uh, first found out about the transition, Kiana and I always assumed we were going to India. That's just the, I was looking at houses. And because when we came to New York, that was the plan. We were going to India. That was the plan. We, we just knew that when Luke and Brandon left, we were going with them. They would say it, but we would say it, all four of us. And then uh, Luke and Brandon actually uh, got the approval, even when they found out they were going to India this time, to take us with them. That's how quick things would have changed. And then, so Kip said, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Take them. Kiana got pregnant. God changed what we thought was going to happen. Well, God didn't change, but our plans did. God said, no, this, this is your plan. The Middle East. So I'm like, hey, amen. Take an Arabic. Let's, let's master this. Let's see if we can get this. I actually just passed my midterm. I was fired up. Got a, got an A. He said, uh, he said, uh, he said something. He said, I can't give A pluses at BMCC. So you got an A. And I was like, oh, sweet. But it's funny because he was saying that, okay, so obviously you guys know I have a, a, a mental health, right? I battle mental health. So I have uh, severe depression, generalized anxiety disorder, and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. And so I'm very open about it. I, I, I even had to accept that. And there are times in your mental health, you got to accept your mental health. You want to get through it, you got to accept. One of the first steps is acceptance. You can't really deal with anything until you accept it. Even the world practices it. You got to accept it. You got to accept your flaws, accept who you are, accept what you've done, whether it be mental health or be your own mistakes, accept it, then you can change it. But if you don't accept it, you're going to be going through the same pattern over and over and over again because you're going to think it's somebody else's fault or you're going to blame God. But you have to accept it that God made you who you are, and that's fine. Okay, anyways, so I have OCD. And so uh, I, have, I like puzzles. So how I calm myself down is puzzles. I play a lot of chess, you know, which is awesome. Uh, I, I, do, I build puzzles. I like little uh, solving. I can do a Rubik's Cube. My fastest time is like, uh, like 45 seconds, something like that. Lo I love it. I just love, love stuff. Love all kind of puzzles. Uh, when I can't solve something, I just think about it until I can figure it out. You know what I mean? I just can't. I can't have to have to happen. I have to finish everything. That's OCD. If I watch a TV series, I got to finish it. Like, my wife and I are watching Harry Potter. Come on. I've seen Harry Potter years ago. My wife's never seen all the movies. And so we're like, all right, man, let's watch it. So we've been watching Harry Potter for about six months. Because my wife, my, wife, my wife just can't finish a movie, you know? We, we start the movie. We get 10 minutes in. I look over. Uh, she has she, she a snore. She doesn't snore, I have a problem. <laughs> she, she doesn't snore. My wife doesn't snore. <laughs> I realize that, that that's not a, amen. But we, but she, she basically, she can't, uh, we, we were on part one of seven, of uh, movie seven. And we've been on part one for movie seven for about a month and a half. You know what I mean? 
And so, but for me, we were watching this movie. I finished this five months ago. Like I watched, I just watched all. I said, I can't wait. I got to, I just watched them. Even though I've seen it before, I just have to finish something, right? And so it, it, it's super important. So my, my professor was saying something like this, like Arabic is really challenging for Americans to learn. It's just hard for us. He's like, I've never seen an American pick it up like you. But that's just my brain. You know, I just, I just understand it, right? But one of the things is, is that when you accept even your flaws or your mental health or your weaknesses, when you accept it, God can turn those into strengths, which is incredible. Because I look at an Arabic letter, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can read that. I just know it. But it's not because of me. It's because I believe it's my OCD and my brain. Just I have to figure it out. It's a strength. Could it be a weakness? Absolutely. But when I rely on God, it becomes a strength. Come on. And it's incredible. But you have to accept it first. Romans chapter 12. In verse 3. We're wrapping it up here. Actually, we have one more scripture. For by the grace given me, verse 3, sorry. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with faith God, uh, the, in accordance with the faith, God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different <laughs> gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift, your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, one of the things that we have to accept is who we are in God's kingdom. We have to accept our role in the church, right? And we know that the body is made up of many different parts. No part is more valuable than the other. We're all valuable. I'm not just going to say, hey, I don't need my pinky. Like, uh, no, I like to shoot basketballs. You know what I mean? Like, I need my pinky. Help us, you know, I got to spread out, you know? That's how you hold the ball. You got to, yeah, yeah. watch out, you know? <laughs> but we would value every piece of our body. It's important to us. And so just like that, it's the same with those in the church. You're all valuable. You see, first is you got to have confidence that you actually do have value here. Because oftentimes it's our own brain that says, oh, no one likes me. No one loves me. The church, you know, no one talks to me. That's okay. Go talk to people. As you talk to people, you know, when I come to church on Sunday, I, I rarely talk to anybody. Because I'm just doing stuff. Running back and forth and going back there, going back there, opening that. Actually, I got to close that back. Um, good, good, good thing I looked over there. <laughs> but it's just like I'm, just, I'm in go mode, right? I got to get things ready. And that's okay. But I, when I do have conversations, they're awesome. You have to seek it out. Don't just wait for someone to come to you. But also look, look, look like you want to talk to somebody. somebody. Sometimes you're like, oh, no one talks to me. And you're sitting there like this. Like... <laughs> Or you got your headphones in. I don't really talk to people who are just texting. You know what I mean? Because I don't want to. I don't want to walk over there and just you just keep doing this. And I'm like, bro, you can get the gift. Put it. <laughs> <laughs> but understand that you have a very special role here. But I want to talk about something else. Okay, come on, John. Oftentimes we need to not accept the role that we have, but we need to accept the role that God wants us to have. All right. Oh my gosh. Let me explain. Some of us, God has called to leadership and ministry. And it's a tough life. <laughs> I'm making eye contact with some of you. Some of us, God is called to sing, to lead worship, to usher, whatever. We have to accept what God wants for us, not what we think God wants for us. Okay. It's lean not on your own understanding, but to trust in God. You see, this is a hard life to accept because what does that mean? Well, that means that your future may be to go to another country and preach the word. You know, uh, Andrew Smelly, he's, he's the first person I, I heard of this was he said something along the lines that when it comes to mission teams, either you pay, either you stay and pay or you go and grow. Yep. 
Now this talks about uh, going on mission teams to plant churches. Either you go and grow, right, because the mission supports you. Or if you're not going, then you stay and you pay, you give missions, right? Those of us in, in our, the American churches are, are, are developed nations. Now, in the future, the near future, a lot of you will probably be asked to go on a church planting. Very possible. I've already surrendered. In my brain, I'm going <laughs> to the Middle East, specifically. I, you know, I, that's why I took Arabic, because I'm like, hey, hey amen, this is Corey's vision. It's my vision. If that's his vision, then I'm going to follow it. It's my leader. He's going he's gonna to be my leader, so I'm gonna, that's his vision. It's mine, too. And, 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 and amen. It's awesome. I, I, I'm Googling places. I'm looking up, trying to get to know the culture. Why? Because I'm surrendered. I'd rather get ahead of the game than just show up not knowing what, what's going on. But some of us, we have to accept that now. You know, it was uh, really awesome. Uh, Daniel shared for uh, uh, communion last week. Yeah. And he, he, we, we were uh, talking in our discipling time. Welcome and uh, Tuesday night, Tuesday night a little, our, our little married D group. Yeah. Um, and it was incredible. I believe this is when the Animas joined us. It was actually all of us. It was a lot of fun. And it was really cool because uh, Danny at one point uh, just, uh, he, he started, he was sharing and what he was feeling and he started crying and I started crying and then Kiana started crying and, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going down. <laughs> but he was sharing about us possibly leaving to the Middle East and he realized, I guess throughout, throughout that week that that was probably going to happen. Logistically, he's been around for a while. He knows how these things work. And he thought about us leaving and it made him very sad and his heart was like bro I would I would go with you and I was like wow that's incredible Ronald came up to me the other day and he said uh, so bro when are we going to the Middle East <laughs> you know but it's uh, it's not about what we want to do it's about what God wants us to do we're surrendered here am I, send me. Right? I'm ready to go. Yep. You know, understand, you know, when you look at the scripture, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. Okay? Let's, let's take a moment. A quick moment. The first word is, all nations. This is Jesus. It doesn't say, Go stay and make disciples of New York City. Yeah. <laughs> go. Yeah, go. And look up the Greek. It still says go. It's move. Get going. <laughs> and make disciples of all nations. You know, this is important because we are not just an American church. Right. Nowhere near. If we were just an American church, this would not be the church of Jesus. We are all nations. And some of you, even in this room, are not American. Imagine if it was just American, you wouldn't be here. And this would not be the church of God. Yeah. Jesus, one, was not American. Amen? American is too young for all that. Let's close out in 1 Peter chapter 5. You know, I, I share this because this is what I'm feeling. Although I am surrendered to going, let me tell you, it sounds tough. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen. Who's coming with me? I've been thinking through the list. If I had to choose, I'm like, who am I taking with me? Need shepherds. We do need shepherds. <laughs> you know, uh, in Psalms 139, don't turn there in verse 13 through 14. The Bible reads... For you created me, my, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know, the world may have its own standard of what's wonderfully made, what's beautiful, what's fearfully made, but God has a different one. Yeah. God created you, faults and all, and you're fearfully and wonderfully made. 
You know, oftentimes we can go against what we look like, what God has given us, the lot that he's given us, uh, our brains, our hearts, our, our minds, even conditions. Why did you give me this condition? But to God, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. No mistakes were made when you were created. Come on. The difference is we must accept the way that God has oh made God. us. And once you accept it, wow. you can see the power that you will have throughout the entire world, everyone that you will come in contact with. And you will see that it doesn't matter. I'm going to heaven one day. Yeah. Where nothing fades away. First Peter chapter 5, let's close out here. In verse 6, the Bible reads, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, submission as a Christian, as a disciple, it's necessary. To surrender is to submit. You see, when you make Jesus Lord, it's Lord. That's master, ruler. I'm going to submit and obey. Whatever you say. But what's incredible is that when you submit and you humble yourself, and you know Jesus was very humble, but when you humble yourself, it says God will lift you up in due time. So you may be in hardship right now. You may be in struggles and temptations. But in due time, God will lift you up. And it will be incredible. You simply must trust God and wait for his answer. But you also must accept the fact that your answer may hit your answer may not be his answer. Yeah. That God may have something else. And you got to be okay with that and surrender. Let us relinquish control of our lives and give our lives fully to God, 100%. Let us accept what God has given us, no matter what that is, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, and to God be all the glory. Woo!